I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical gold and silver dealer really specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the reset that we are already well walking through. And welcome to 2021. I expect this to be quite an interesting year. And there are a lot of things that are kicking off this year, by the way, as well. So we'll just start with the COVID cases. Ooh, let me grab my pointer. And uh, as most of you probably know that they are surging again as are hospitalizations. Well, you know, there are 125,544 coronavirus patients hospitalized nationally. So this is really straining the hospitals. Of course, I would also mention, because we're going to be talking a little bit more about this in a couple of slides, that Big Pharma has been one of the leading contributors in lobbying efforts and contributions to all of the political candidates. I think that's kind of interesting. But uh, the most of any point in the pandemic and double the peaks of spring and summer. So I don't think there's gonna be too many people running out. And we know that the lockdowns are happening in a number of different parts around the world. And now they're concerned about an easy to spread COVID variant in the US, which of course makes vaccines urgent. Personally, I'm not going to get one, but I think everybody needs to do whatever they're comfortable doing. There's also a new strain that's coming up in Africa that they are at least at this point saying will not respond to the current vaccine and will require a new vaccine. But you know, this kind of reminds me, everything that's happening really kind of reminds me about that piece that goes, how do you capture a wild boar? And you do it slowly and you get them used to each piece until all of the walls are in place and then you have them and they volunteered their freedom. I'm just saying, that's really what makes having physical gold completely out of the system so significant and so much more important than even I thought it was before. Because they're definitely, as you know, taking us digital. And now, of course, Spain is starting to register those who refuse the COVID vaccine. Okay, well, now, in the interview with the head of the European, wait, the health minister said that the vaccinations would not be mandatory. Well, TSA isn't mandatory. It's only required if you want to fly. But they want to assure us that what will be done is a register, which will be shared with our European partners of those people who have been offered it and have simply rejected it. But, you know, don't worry because they're not really going to use it. We certainly know that no, nobody can hack into the system and get any information about you privately out there into the public domain. But he offered that people who are offered a therapy that they refuse for any reason, it will be noted in the register that there is no error in the system not to have given this person the possibility of being vaccinated. You know, we've seen so many things like this and it's like taxes. You know taxes in the US are voluntary, but what happens if you don't pay those taxes? There are serious consequences. So we're gonna see how this whole thing unrolls. But, you know, this, these things are being tested and people are so scared and so nervous, they're lining up for the vaccine. You know, um, my daughter is going to get vaccinated. She's a healthcare worker. She's a doctor. Or she already has had her one shot. She'll go for a sec. Do I agree with it? Personally, no. But again, I still love her. She's my daughter and I support whatever choices she makes. Now, I wanted to talk a bit about lobbying. EU lobbying by fund groups fuels fears over vested interest. 
And specifically in this particular article, they're talking about BlackRock. And you know, BlackRock has really kind of taken over the status of that Goldman Sachs used to have. It's really interesting because of course they have all of this expertise, but listen to this. It's risky for, for the commission to rely on expertise from a sector that they are supposed to regulate. You think? It's the fox watching the hen house and telling them, oh, build the hen house like this because it makes it easier for them to get what they want. And the point is, when there are few extremely dominant players that have a loud voice in terms of lobbying, it becomes problematic. You think? Yeah, I think it becomes problematic. And that's why when we're looking what's ha like what's happening out in the real economy, the haves have gotten a lot heavier. They've gotten a lot. They've, they've made a tremendous amount of all that new fiat money that's been printed. But the real economy, the majority of the public is really suffering. And now that we're in the new year, it will be interesting to see what happens to the real estate market with all of the mortgage moratoriums being lifted and the rent evictions, uh, that's all supposed to have come to an end. It'll take a while to work through the system, but we'll see what that looks like. But lest we don't feel left out, because we do know that BlackRock is instrumental in the new programs that the Federal Reserve has set up, I looked at the lobbying in the U.S. and in this, this is from the SEC. And remember, you have access to all of these links on our blog. Follow them. They're really pretty interesting. But in the U.S. SEC filing since 2010, BlackRock has spent $21,280,000 on federal lobbying. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Well, this is 2003 where they didn't really spend very much, 2004, okay? Now, once the, once the great financial crisis hit in 2008 and 9, 7, 8, well, you can see how much that lobbying has really paid off. And for them to be in a position now where they are really working with governments directly on these rules and these laws and the different things, I don't know. Do you think they have a vested interest? What about the states? Well, obtaining comprehensive state lobbying information is described by an expert as nearly impossible, but they have spent significantly on lobbying in several of the states that they could get the data on, uh, namely in this particular report from the SEC, in New York and in California, upwards to 3 million just in those two states alone. But probably my favorite piece from this SEC filing was, uh, this was in Davos in 2016, BlackRock CEO Lawrence Fink stated that lobbying is really good because it is maximizing shareholder value. In other words, they get the laws and the rules written the way that it benefits them and also, of course, all that new money. I mean, here's the central bank. They're in the center of the wheel. And here is, here's BlackRock right outside of it. Okay, the government is actually outside of that. Where are you and me? We're way out here. Those that have the closest relationship to those that create the money get the biggest benefit. And if they're right along those that create the laws and the rules, okay, you can see the result of it. But I love that. Nothing matters but shareholder value, not the man on the street. But let's take a little deeper look into lobbying and I can do a whole piece on it. I have done a whole piece on it in the past. This starts in 98. So this is, be oh, I cut that off. I'm sorry. This is between 98 and 2019. So last year. And, you know, you saw, you didn't really see any dip. You saw a ramp up. Here's 2008, 2007. 
So as the crisis was unfolding, because it really started breaking down in 2007, even though it didn't become apparent for the masses until September of 2018. But look at the ratchet up and the levels of lobbying, right? Whose benefit do you think? We have a bifurcated government, right? You've got the haves and you've got the have nots. They're writing the rules for those that are in there that are, you know, greasing the wheels. What can I tell you? I thought this was really interesting too. The biggest spenders again in 2019, uh, Chamber of Commerce. Okay, that's small business, but they're not really seeming to, small business has been decimated, let's face it. Uh, National Association of Realtors is right there. Let's see, Pharmaceutical Research and, Amer and, and uh, Manufacturers in America. That's a nice chunk of change. American Hospital Association, Blue Cross Blue Shield, American Medical Association. And then you've got the Business Roundtable and Amazon and Facebook. So these are the top 10 lobbying, uh, lobby spending or spending on lobbying. Okay, that tells you quite a bit, especially look at, I suppose if you took all the pharmaceuticals and medical and totaled them up, that would be a lot higher than uh, the US Chamber of Commerce. But of course we know what happens when the corporations are really in charge. And that is that the average guy, the average wage earner suffers. And we've talked about this quite a bit in the past too, has been the decline in the unions. And I mean, the, the growth of the unions have happened in government departments and state and federal departments. But out there in the normal workplace, they've been declining quite a bit, you know, since the 1960s, right? And they've been transferring the risk of your retirement back in the, in the 50s. It was defined benefit pension plans, which are all underwater. So any of those that are really depending upon them, you know, I mean, this is another reason why this crisis had to happen now because the aging of the, globally, the aging of the population has already underway. And, you know, that crisis is already unfolding. But I have some hope because I have to tell you that I do think that there is a grassroots movement underway. Google staff launch union escalating tensions with leaders. Well, this just came out yesterday. So are we going to see an increase in unions? I mean, I remember that back in the 60s and the 70s, my father was a developer and, you know, I'll have to think about that a lot more, but I know that a union wanted to come into where he, uh, to his company and he would have dealt with whatever he needed to deal with. But I, as a child, I remember hearing him not like the unions. So, but he did pay a fair wage and he had a very, it wasn't a huge corporation, it was a small business. And so he had a close relationship with all of his workers. You know, I have to say that the decline in unions has not been really beneficial. That's kept wages low and it's not in nominal terms, it's actually in real terms that it's made quite a difference. Average wage back then, about $9,500. A family of four could live on that. Today, average wage about 53,000. Though they're sending out stimulus checks, 600, for those earning less than 75 or couples earning less than 150,000 a year. So what does that really tell you about the wages and the value of the dollar? That's the biggest piece. It's not whether or not the dollar goes up or down against other currencies, which right now it's going down. It's how it impacts you is based upon what you can purchase with it. So for a couple, earning $150,000, that would have been a fortune back in the 70s or 80s. 
today you're required you require stimulus but what's happening with spot gold and spot silver remember these are still contracts and you know this this graph goes back to july and of course they were pushing down the price of uh, the spot price of both of these metals but guess what happened with gold yesterday a breakout above the trend line and we see the same kind of action with silver what this means is that the most likely outcome is that it's going up but that's in terms of spot so i really want you to understand this is a great time to be building your position not because it broke out but because it's still not reflecting its fundamental value it is anticipated that we will see inflation, official inflation, which takes out everything we buy because we know we've got inflation. But they're going to let it run above 2%. And a lot of analysts on the street thinks it's going to hit that 2% this year, which means what you and I buy and need on a daily basis will be substantially higher than that. Got gold, got silver. That's the foundation of the strategy because it's real money. It's not that you're going to stay in them forever and ever. They should always maintain a position. But depending upon where we are in this trend cycle would determine how much of your portfolio you should have in there, as well as your goals and your comfort level, etc. But we're now in 2021 and they're not done experimenting. I want to hold my wealth in something that is the safest and most secure thing that you can do because the world has gone insane and we know it. So all I can tell you is get your gold and silver, execute the strategy. It's not just gold and silver. It's what are you going to do with it? Because out of crisis, there are always opportunities. Will the stock market keep going up? until it gets too expensive to support. We're kind of seeing some of that happen in China right now where they're no longer supporting some of the government companies or private corporations and they're allowing them to go bust. It's because it got too expensive. Gold and silver severely undervalued. So what are our reminders today? Can you scroll up for me, please? because I know I have, oh yeah, oh good. This week, I'm gonna be on with my friend Tony over in New Zealand, a minute to midnight. And I think we're doing that on Thursday, is that? Yeah, we're doing that on Thursday. So he usually gets those out pretty good and, and we'll let you know when they do. And next week, I'm going to be on a financial literacy symposium, ODOS Synergy Services. It's virtual. And it's private, but it is a webinar, and I'm really, really excited about this. You can join, uh, and we'll post the link on our socials as well as are you going to put it below in this too, and also on the blog. So I'm very, very excited about that one. I've been waiting to do this for quite some time, and I think it's really important that everybody is financially literate. That's what my work is all about. So keep in mind that without one little doubt in my mind, it is time to cover your assets. And here at ITM Trading, you're going to see a lot more about this. We do this with the Wealth Shield, which is a really comprehensive approach, but simple to understand. So again, let me welcome you to the new year. 2021 should be a very, very interesting year ahead. And until tomorrow, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.